Hi everyone, thanks for listening to another episode of Dogman Encounters Radio. I'm Vic Cundiff and I'll be your host for the show. If you've had a Dogman Encounter of your own and would like to speak with me, whether in private or on the show, please go to dogmanencounters.com and submit a report. I'd love to hear from you. If you've listened to the show for some time now, you'll probably remember tonight's guest, Lisa, from episode 72. Since that show aired, Lisa's had more experiences that she's come on to share with you. Lisa, thanks for coming back. Hey, Vic, how are you? I'm doing great, and you? I'm doing good. Good. For the people who missed episode 72, Lisa, please give us a brief bio on yourself. Well, let's see, I have been interested in cryptozoology pretty hardcore since 2001. I've had experiences as far back as I can remember, about four or five up into the last incident that we had might have been about two weeks ago. So I've been studying this on my own and recently started my own research. I'm a U.S. Army veteran. I have four children. That's about it. I can't really think of anything else to tell. Oh, that's more than enough right there. You sent me a series of pictures, Lisa, that I'm going to post in the YouTube version of tonight's show. What can you tell us about each one of those photos? Well, the first one that's coming to mind, there's a photograph of me at age 13. It was taken at night. It was actually taken during the slumber party incident that I mentioned in episode 72, where there was what we think was a type 3 throwing rocks at the house. If you can look in the window, there's actually a pair of eyes that seem to be looking in my direction. I've had that picture analyzed by a researcher out in the Four Corners, and he came back and told me that the eyes are definitely real, but he couldn't light up the face enough for us to see exactly what was looking in the window. Whatever it was, that was a second-story window, I want to say about... 20 feet from the ground. And the only reason why I stumbled across that picture was because I was going through an old photo album that I found and just happened to notice two points of light in the window. And when I looked closer, definitely looked like eye shine to me. Let's see. I've also sent pictures of tree breaks. Two of the tree breaks that I sent are tree breaks that have happened around my new house. One, you'll see a tree that's laying in the road. That happened when I was inside my house, and I heard the tree breaking, so I did not see what happened. The other one, let me see, it's kind of like a nice twist, and then you'll see branches sitting on top of my house. In another photo, that I found when I came home from work one day. There's also some tree breaks that I sent you, several in one tree. I think it's a locust tree that I found in a graveyard here where I've been doing some research. Also, I think I sent you a picture of a rock that was thrown at my daughter's ex-boyfriend several yards from a creek bed to where he was working outside at the local high school. Another set should be pictures of my in-law's place. There's a very strange one that I had a few other researcher friends look at They circle the face that's in the trees, and then what appears to be some sort of creature on top of a tractor that's also circled. Let me see. I'm not sure what else I may have sent to you other than a photograph of my daughter's foot next to what appears to actually be a Sasquatch print. That we found in one of the graveyards that has several tree breaks in it that we've gone to to do some research in. And I can't remember any of the other ones that I may have sent that you looked through. No, I think that just about covers it. All the photos you just mentioned are pretty self-explanatory, but the first one you mentioned where the eyes are seen looking in the window at you, was there some kind of an eve out there that it could have been standing on if it was a dog man or some creature looking in, or would it have had to have clung to the side of the house to look in that window if it was actually a creature looking in? I think it would have been on the roof, and it would have had to kind of bend down and look in. 
Okay, I see. And there's also a picture, I just realized that there was also another picture I sent to you of an individual of some sort peeking around a tree, and there's an arrow pointing to the top of it, and it's definitely a dog's head, and it could just be a normal dog, but when I took the photograph of the woods, I was actually taking pictures of a stick figure that's in that photograph as well. It just may not show up. And when I sent that picture to another researcher, he's the one that found the dog head and drew the arrow over it and pointed that out to me. So that covers the photos as far as I know. I hope it was just a regular dog looking around that tree. It's possible. Yeah, it's really hard to know. You moved to Tennessee in March of 2015. Why'd you move there? Well, my husband got injured on the job out in California. He sustained some back injuries, and he couldn't work, and he was not making enough money just from disability, and I wasn't making enough money from my job, and we knew that we weren't going to be able to live there. So we came back to Tennessee to be closer to his family in order to kind of help out at that time. That makes sense. Tennessee is one of the states with the highest number of reported dogman encounters. Do you have any opinions on why that is? Well, in Middle Tennessee, where I am, we have a very large deer population. In fact, if you go hunting in the fall, you can actually harvest four deer a day. So that's a very large population. There's also lots of hollows. I think there's some abandoned mines around here. There's a huge cave system that runs underneath in some areas. There's lots of hills, lots of very thick foliage during the spring and summer, you know, into fall. Lots of wild berries that grow here, passion fruit, honeysuckle, blackberries, currant, that kind of thing. Tennessee is known for just its abundance of wildlife, especially just woodland creatures, and lots and lots of water. Lots of creeks, lots of rivers, lots of lakes. So it definitely could sustain something as large as a dogman. Yeah, it would be the perfect place for them. Before we talk about the encounters you and your family have had, last spring you heard about an attack that piqued your interest. What was it about that attack that grabbed your attention? Well, I was actually picking up a pizza, and the news was on, and they were talking about the Great Smoky Mountains National Forest, which, as a Tennessean, piqued my interest, but also because of David Politis' research in Missing 411, where he talked about different disappearances in that area. There apparently was a lady who I think was jogging along the trail out there and she got attacked by what they were calling a bear but the authorities were saying that this bear had a strange bite pattern they wanted to make sure that they didn't just kill some random bear and say that that was it so they were basically on the hunt for this particular bear that had a unique teeth pattern and I instantly was thinking okay it probably wasn't a bear that attacked her especially since they were mentioning the teeth being different but the woman said that it happened so fast, the only thing that she saw was just like a really large black blur and something bit her on the leg and ran past her, and she told authorities that she thought it was a bear. I haven't heard any follow-up to that story, but I am interested in wondering if they actually ever found anything or this bear that had the strange teeth. Yeah, it does make you wonder. You say that a dogman seems to be living around your in-law's property and that several family members have had encounters with it. What can you tell us about their experiences? Well, my kids first mentioned to me that they were seeing what looked like large, dark shadows along the wood line of their grandmother's property, some of them on the other side of a horse pasture. And... I've suspected that something's been there since we moved here, mostly because of a very large footprint I found back in the spring of 15. And even comparing it to some other tracks, such as like mountain lion tracks, the claws were out on this track. So I know that it was not a cat because cats, they withdraw their 
claws and dogs don't. So that kind of made me suspicious. But then I had my daughter approach me and tell me that her first sighting that she had, she was watching her younger sisters and they were playing in the snow and she looked back towards where the wood line started and she said there was a very large wolf-like creature that was standing upright and it was just standing in the woods watching them. She remained as calm as possible and she gathered her sisters and she went into the house And I remember her actually calling me and telling me that she had seen this and that it really scared her and that she didn't want, you know, anybody else to know because she didn't want to scare her little sisters, but that she was refusing to go outside because of that. The next incident that she had was this last fall. We have a food allergy that runs in my family, and she ended up eating a popsicle that had banana in it which we're highly allergic to. And she went outside to make herself throw up because she panicked. We go into anaphylactic shock. So she was trying to get it out of her system. And then her cousin, who was spending the night at the in-laws with her, came outside to help her clean up. And they had turned the hose on and they were cleaning the concrete and everything. And my daughter was pretty much preoccupied with just cleaning. But my niece said she looked up and about 15 feet from them, there's a little grove of trees, and she said that there was what she described as like a werewolf standing there, and it was just watching them. And so she panicked and aimed the hose right at its face and blasted it with water, and it dropped down to all fours and just ran off, jumped over the fence into the horse pasture, and took off into the woods. And she said it was very large and really, really fast. And my daughter just saw it leaving, I think, when she mentioned that it was there, but my niece was pretty much in shock. I think it was her first time seeing it, and my daughter was well aware that it had been around, so they stayed up and talked about it, and um, I believe my niece told her that that wasn't the first time she'd seen one, but it was the first time that she saw something there. I believe near her home, she said that she'd seen a wolf-like creature. She didn't want to talk about that incident at all, so I don't really know the details of that particular incident. I myself saw what I believe is the same individual. The first time I saw it, let's see, was when we were hunting back in October in the far end of the property that's wooded. And I was in the tree stand and I heard something. It's really kind of hard to describe the noise that I heard. It sounded like barking but it sounded throaty, so it almost sounded as if it was being choked out. Not really a gurgling noise, but just sort of sort of like it was trying to bark without opening its mouth. And actually, that wasn't the first time I'd heard that noise around there. I've, I've heard it a few times. But at this time, I heard it, and I saw in front of me, maybe about 20 feet through the trees, something large and brown moving but I could really only get a good look at the shoulder down and the arms down. And I just remember very long arms and it resembling a lot of the depictions of dogmen with the really long arms. And I remember it moving left to right and then it just kind of stopped and was sort of in the trees and then it went back in the direction that it came from. And I wasn't alone. I was with my husband at the time, but he was on the ground. And I don't know if he saw it or not, but I didn't even mention it to him because I I didn't want him thinking that I was imagining things. But that was my first time. And I believe it was the same individual that I saw this past fall in the same area of trees way back about, I want to say maybe 200 or 300 yards from the house. And that would be the area that my daughter saw it in the winter before. And when I saw it, I was leaving my in-laws and something kind of caught my attention in that direction. And I looked and saw this very big creature, wolf-like head, long ears, long snout, but an incredibly muscle-bound body. The only way I can describe it is, and I know that this has been said before, but it's kind of spot on. 
it really physically reminded me a lot of the werewolves that were in the first Underworld movie. Just that, just that build, just really, really muscle bound, very tall. And I did make eye contact with it and I looked away and I just kept going and, you know, definitely had a feeling of healthy fear and really just kind of shaking my head like this is unbelievable that I'm even seeing this thing again. But I really just didn't want, I didn't want to, you know, stay in one place and watch it. I just wanted to get out of there. And then I remember talking to my daughter about it and describing the area that I'd seen it in. And that, that just seemed to be its spot. It just has a particular spot that it likes to hang out in and just kind of watch the house or watch us when we're there. Well, that's awfully creepy. Yeah, we don't go back there, or at least my kids are not allowed back there. I've made that, <laughs> that clear. They don't go back there. And if I've gone back there, I've gone, I haven't gone by myself, but I don't, I don't like going back there at all, even for anything. And it's really kind of sad because it's a beautiful spot, but you know, just knowing that it's it's back there just does not make me comfortable at all. Have you ever sat down with your in-laws and asked them if they had any dogman encounters of their own there? I have not sat down with them and just come straight out and asked, mostly because they wouldn't talk about it openly. But they have hinted about something being there, mostly because for a long time, at the end of their driveway, it was just dark and they had a lamp post actually installed because they said that something was lurking around the house at night. And apparently it was doing the same to the neighbors. And so I think they and their neighbor split the bill on this lamp post and put it close to their yard, the neighbor's yard, but at the end of my in-law's driveway. And everybody kind of felt safer once that was installed. And my father-in-law mentioned that they used to compost and so he would walk all the way through this field, which was about six acres, to the wood line, and he would dump food up there. But he said that he would hear some really creepy noises that just chilled his blood, you know. He said that he heard things like howls and growling and everything pretty close to the time after he dumped the food, and he stopped doing that. I'm trying to think of anything else that they mentioned, but I honestly can't think of anything. I know that they were adamant about not allowing any of the grandkids back in those woods. But that's really about it. Not letting them back there sounds like a pretty good move to me. Not long after you moved into your home in Tennessee, a series of strange events happened. Please tell us more about that. Well, where I am now, I'm still in the Nashville area, but I think about three days in... We did have some stormy weather. I mean, it wasn't huge, but, you know, we had a typical thunderstorm. And the following morning, I was leaving for work, and it was still really dark. And as I was going to my car, I kind of had the feeling of being watched, and I looked over to the small wooded area that's in my backyard, and I saw a glimpse of what I thought may have been eye shine. It was very, very quick. There was just one point of light, eye shades. And it was so fast that it was almost like I wasn't sure if I was imagining it or not. So I just kind of ignored it and got in my car and went to work. But when I came home, there was a very large tree break that happened in what I think is a locust tree. And the branches were actually laid on top of my roof over my son's bedroom. And so I came in the house. And I asked the kids if they had heard anything, and they they said that they hadn't heard anything, so I made them come outside, and we stood in the yard, and we looked. And, I mean, it was very impressive, a very large bow, and it was splintered as if it had been twisted. You know, and I asked my son, and he was insistent that he heard nothing. They didn't hear anything. They didn't feel anything hit the house, nothing. So I thought that was really weird. I just kind of brushed that one off of, well, it's either possible that everybody slept through it and it happened during the storm, but given that it was a twist, I don't think that was storm damage. And so the next strange thing was about a few weeks later, 
my car had broken down and so I had to wait for my coworkers to come pick me up and I went outside onto our porch to wait and there was a raccoon out there and it was digging in the trash and I don't I don't like raccoons. I know that might sound silly after all the things that I've been dealing with, but I, I really have a healthy fear of raccoons. <laughs> and so and part of it's because they're aggressive and they carry rabies and I, I just I don't want to get bit, you know. So I went back inside and this raccoon had an attitude and was actually standing outside on the porch looking at me in the window and everything. It was pretty comical. But we had the windows open in the kitchen because it was just one of the hottest areas and our AC wasn't working at the time. And so I was in the kitchen and all of a sudden I hear this crack, just this really, really large cracking sound. I didn't even know it was wood. I mean, it just honestly, it sounded kind of like a car crash in a way. And I look out the window and it was so dark. It was way too dark for me to see anything except I think the same raccoon running across the lawn like it was trying to get away from somebody or, or the noise. And so I ended up going back outside because it was getting late and I knew my ride would come soon. And I was sitting on the porch and sure enough, a car comes down the street and it's slowing down and it stops in front of my house. And so I say, oh, okay, my ride's here. And so I start walking towards the street and then I look and I see this huge branch is laying in the middle of the road. And it's from one of my trees. And the car is trying to find a way around it. And then I realized that that was the noise I heard inside my house. So somehow another tree got broken. And this time it was laid out in front of the road in the street. The third tree break happened about a month ago. And my kids and I, we had the doors open. I think we were cooking. I mean, the TV was on. We were just going about our business, and I went outside to lock my car up, and the smaller tree, I'm not even sure what it is, but it's kind of hard to identify it because it's covered with kudzu, but there was a break that was about 15 feet up, and it was smaller, so it's just as if something was either jumping on that branch or just pulled it down, and probably maybe maybe like six inches in circumference. So it was a smaller break, but it was up higher. And it was just kind of sitting there in the yard. And my first thought was, great, my landlord's going to be mad at me because all of his trees keep breaking. And he's going to somehow think it's my fault. And then I was like, we were just in the house and we were doing, you know, our usual thing and, you know, didn't hear anything. And this is the middle of the day when traffic's a little bit heavy. How did something sneak up and just break a branch and leave it there? Unless, I mean, maybe kids came in my yard and did it. I don't know. One of my kids asked if a deer would do that, and I'm really not sure. And we do have deer that run through our neighborhood. But I ended up doing some investigating of my own and found this canal that's running through my property. And there's a conduit on one end and there's a bridge on the other And it's a very large conduit. And when I was getting closer to look at it, I actually felt kind of creeped out and sort of stuck my cell phone in and and took some pictures. And it looks as if there is something very large and dark wedged back there. And I had to kind of do my own experimenting with light because I only saw a small bit coming through. And I went back later at different times. And the two times that I did go back, I could see that there's a circle of light coming in. I did that in the morning, and then I did it in the evening, just with the sun being in different positions in the sky. And there was more light each time. So I think the first time I looked through, there could have been something or someone wedged all the way back in the back. I'm thinking it has to be about six feet in diameter. So I don't really know, but I also saw, I stood next to the tree that had the first tree break, and if somebody was sitting back there, they would have had a very clear view of me going to my car. And also in that area, there was a very strong animal smell, and the only way that I can really 
describe it is it kind of made me think of the zoo. When you go to the zoo and you're around some of the larger animals, there's definitely a very distinct kind of musky odor, which I was smelling, but it also smelled like wet dog, which has me very curious because I don't know if that wet dog smell is associated with dogman encounters or not. You know, or it could have been anything. And the only other time that I smelled that was about, I think actually about two weeks ago now, I was going outside to work and I smelled it very strongly around my car. And that was it. That was the only second time that I smelled it. One of the other incidences that was interesting may have also been about a month ago or a month and a half ago when I had some sort of vocalization. It was when my car was still broken down and another time when I had to have somebody come pick me up to take me to work. And I was outside and I heard something make a noise that kind of sounded like a chuff. It was just kind of like a, like a, like a grunt. And then I heard something move along the dark side of the house away from me and go towards the canal. And whatever it was, it was large. And if it was a person, it had to have been a pretty big person, and you could hear their footsteps hitting the earth. So it's possible it was a person. I mean, I, I didn't see it, so I can't give a positive ID as to what it was. And then. When I came home that evening, I told my kids, and my son told me that he was hearing noises outside at night, and he was just kind of nonchalant about it. And I said, well, why didn't you mention this before? And he said, because I don't know what it is. And he'd only described it as like a very low, almost like a low frequency, but like a growl, but that it almost sounded metallic or like an engine. Like, that's how low the frequency is. And he said that it didn't seem like it was threatening, but that he almost got the feeling that whatever it was, it wanted him to know that it was there. You mentioned the strange sounds your son heard, but you did mention the doorknob incident. Please tell us about that. Right, right. That happened about a week ago. That was about a week ago, and I'd forgotten about that. That, I have no idea. All I know is he said that it was right after I went to work, so it was still dark, and he said someone or something tried the door. It was turning the doorknob, and it really freaked him out. But I don't know how long it went on for, but he said, you know, it just seemed like they were trying to get in, and then after a while it stopped. And for me, I was thinking, okay, well, you know, that could have been somebody trying to break in. I mean, it is possible, but I told him, if that happens again, just call 911 in case somebody is trying to break in. But who knows what the possibilities are considering he's had his own thing going on in the back of the house at night. Speaking of your son, he had an encounter of his own while he was at his high school one time. What did he tell you about that experience? Well, my son knows my history, and he knows that his sisters have seen things, and he's he's kind of skeptical. So he was... At the high school, and it was in the evening, and it was back in the fall when it was kind of dark, you know, early. And I know he was doing laps, and I'm not sure which activity that was for. But he ended up down all the way on the other side of the football field, and the football field backs up to farmland. Pretty much the high school is surrounded by nothing but farmland. They just built it out in the middle of nowhere. And he said that something catches attention out of the corner of his eye. And he looked into the field, and he said he saw what looked to him pretty much like a werewolf chasing a car. He said there was a box on top of the car, and he remembered the car was blue, and he remembered this thing was down on all fours, and he said it was black, it had a large wolf-like head, but he said by the way that it moved, it kind of reminded him of Shadow. So he said it was almost as if he wasn't sure if he was actually seeing it looking like that because it was solid and it was just moving so fast that it gave it 
the illusion of shadow, but he definitely got a really good look at the head. And he said the car drove into the trees and the creature chased the car into the trees and then it just disappeared. And so he was extremely baffled. He was pretty much shooken up because I think it was something that he'd hope he'd never encounter. You know, he, he doesn't follow cryptozoology. I mean, he doesn't listen to any shows about it or anything on YouTube about it. He doesn't read about it. Nothing like that. So for him to actually see something, it shook him up for a while. It actually took him a while to even tell me in more detail. But I do remember picking him up and he did say, okay, mom, I saw a dog man. And I had asked where, and he said it was next door, and it was chasing a car. And I said, are you positive you saw this? And he said, yeah, I I saw it. But he didn't really talk about how it made him feel until later, because I think he was still processing it at the time that I picked him up. Well, I'm glad at least he finally shared that with you instead of holding it in. Right, right. Yeah, when you see something that looks like a werewolf chasing a car, especially at his age, that's not easy to deal with. Yeah, it's not, especially when you, you know, he's very smart. He's got a high IQ. He's very no-nonsense, very straight to the point. I mean, even just as an individual, that's just who he is. And for him to see something that didn't make sense, it really was kind of hard for him to wrap his mind around it. No, I'm sure it was. You said he also might have had an encounter in California about three years ago. What can you tell us about that experience? Well. I sent him to go pick up one of his sisters at a friend's house, and the friend was literally just two streets over from us. And he walked over to Gatta, and there was a set of bushes on the corner, and he was walking past it, and he said that he heard something in the bushes, and that he turned his head to look, like, or in his peripheral vision, he saw what looked like a dog's head. And so he turned to look at it thinking that he was looking at a dog, but he said that it was very massive and it was just pulling back into the bushes. And it shook him up so bad that by the time he got to my daughter's friend's house, he pretty much just walked in the house and just kind of grabbed her by the arm and just pulled her out of the house and just kept pulling her up the street. And she was getting angry with him and trying to get him to stop. And he just kept shaking his head and just told her, just come on. And when they got back towards the bushes, I think he started running and just tried to make her run with him to get past the bushes because he didn't know if anything was still there. And he just told me about that, or they just told me about that, I think about a year ago. And my daughter was in the room when he mentioned it, and she looked at him. And said, oh, that's why you did that. And he said, yeah. And she was like, why didn't you just tell me what you saw? And he was like, because I didn't want to talk about it. And again, you know, he's still not sure if it was just a dog, just a very large dog, or if it was something else. Yeah, that probably was a smart move on his part by not telling her exactly what he had seen. He probably would have had to spend quite a bit of time to convince her. So, yeah, just trying to get her to move along, that probably was the best move. What's the story behind him seeing something that looked like Anubis? Yeah, that's one that really still has both of us confused, only because we're not even sure where that was or how old he was. When he was starting to talk about these things, he was asking me questions such as, do you know if dogmen can make you forget that you've ever seen them? And I told him that I really wasn't sure. And he said, okay, because I have a memory of seeing something that looked like Anubis. He really kind of described it as looking like Anubis, but also looking a little bit like a Doberman pincher. And he said, all I remember is that it was looking in a window at me, and it was at night, and that he said that he felt like he should remember seeing it, but it's as if, His mind will not allow him to remember seeing it, so he's not sure if it happened or not, and that really was bothering him, and it's something that I couldn't answer. I don't know if they have the ability, you know, some sort of supernatural ability to make you forget that you've seen them, or 
if seeing it was just so traumatizing that it's his mind's way of making him feel like maybe it didn't happen at all. He doesn't remember how old he was, and he's just not really sure where it even happened. That is really strange. When you could swear that you saw something like that, but you can't put a finger on when or where it was, that is awfully hard to deal with. Right. Your oldest daughter snuck out one night and might have had an encounter of her own. What did she tell you about that experience? That was also when we were in California, and it was in an area. It's a deactive military base. Parts of it are still used by the military, but there's thousands of acres that are no longer in use. And a friend of hers lived up there, and she spent the night, and I guess they were still awake, and I think it was about 2 or 3 in the morning, and they decided to sneak out and go to a golf course up there for some reason. And for the majority of their walk, they kept hearing somebody following them. And so they thought it was the friend's little brother, and so they would stop and they would yell at him, supposedly telling him to go back home and all this other stuff. And, of course, there was no answer. But by the time that they got to the golf course, they were sitting down near some trees, I think, and they were just kind of hanging out and talking. And then they kept hearing something in the trees. And my daughter says that she saw a pair of red eyes and that it actually came a little bit closer and she finally got a better look at it and its head, she said the silhouette of the head looked like a dog's head and she described it as like a German shepherd. I don't know if the friend saw it too or if my daughter just saw it, but she said that she looked away and she tried to pretend that it wasn't there and they finally made the decision to go back and it didn't follow them back, but she was very shooken up. When she actually shared this with me, for her, it was pretty traumatizing to relive it. You know, she was shaking. Her voice was shaking. I had to kind of talk her through it and just tell her it was okay and that I believed her. But it really, really shook her up. And I do remember she didn't want to spend the night at her friend's house anymore. I think that that kind of did it for her. She was just, I think, too scared of having another incident like that happen. For some reason, a lot of eyewitnesses have reported seeing dogmen on golf courses like that. Keep that in mind the next time you're playing around. You were driving down the road one time with that same daughter when she told you about seeing something strange. Please expand upon that for us. Yeah, that was here in Tennessee. And I think I was in North Nashville, actually, which kind of is more hilly, lots of hollows. And I believe it was in the same location near my in-laws and near my son's high school. It was a, probably about noon and we're driving past what I think was a convenience store that was adjacent to a small subdivision. And from the back seat, she says, Mama, I just saw a monkey in a dumpster. And I remember... I instantly got kind of hit with fear because I was very deep in the Sasquatch at that time and thinking, you know, that's kind of like very familiar to some Sasquatch encounters I had heard of with them being in dumpsters. And so I said, are you sure it was a monkey? Are you sure it wasn't just a man standing in the dumpster, maybe digging for something? And she was like, no, no, mama, it was covered in black hair and its face is really ugly like a monkey. And so I think I turned around and drove back that way because I wanted her to look again just to see if she was really seeing it. And when we drove past, there was nothing there. But it kind of had me shooken up. And she, it just didn't seem to face her. And that might just be because she was a young child. I think she was only like six or seven. But it kind of had me more shooken up and worried about what it could actually have been. Did she ever seem to notice whether that creature had a muzzle or not? You know, I don't know for sure. I can ask her. I just remember that she told me. Actually, I think she said it was baboon-like, come to think of it, that it was kind of ugly in the way that a baboon is, but just a really ugly face, and it was just kind of just digging and sort of throwing things around, but it was facing our direction. 
Well, if it looked like a baboon to her, then that does point to the idea that it had a muzzle on it, so that makes sense. It's possible. It is possible. Yeah, it sure is. Your youngest daughter thinks she might have seen a dogman a couple of years ago. What did she tell you about that? She mentioned that at her school, which is also surrounded by a body of water and woods, that she saw what she thought was a husky, but she said that the husky was standing up and it was watching the kids play on the playground. And I also remember her saying that she thinks that it had blue eyes, which I think is why she mentioned it looking like a husky, which I thought was interesting, or at least very light-colored eyes. But it just seemed to just really be interested in just watching the kids play. I showed her pictures of huskies, but I even showed her some pictures of dogmen and she said that it seemed similar to some of the muscular built, but she said it really looked a lot like a dog. And so it's really hard for me to know. I mean, I've been out there a few times, and there's, it seems like it's kind of a strange place, and I could see it being really creepy at night or really creepy when it was dark out during the day. But that was it. I mean, she mentioned that. I think she saw it, and one other little girl saw it, and... They kind of looked at it for a little while, and then they just kind of went about their business and just continued playing. Did she ever mention any features that, to you, pointed towards the idea that it could not have been a dog, that it definitely seemed to be a dogman that she saw? Other than her saying that it was really big and that she said it was standing on its hind legs. That's really the only way that she described it. So she was about six or seven when she saw this. So just from her perspective as a kid, to her, it just looked like a really big husky just standing on his back legs and just watching the kids play. Well, there are some huskies that are pretty big, not as big as a Malamute, for example, but huskies do get fairly big from time to time. The fact that it was standing on his back legs, yeah, that points towards the idea that it wasn't necessarily a normal dog, but since she was so young, I guess we'll never really know for sure. Right, exactly. And I mean, she said the coloration was similar. So that's the part that I'm really not sure about. I mean, I don't know if dogmen come in all colors, in different variations or not, but I know that she said it had a lot of gray, and I think the face had some white on it, and the chest was a little bit white, very similar to the pattern of a husky, and the eyes stood out to her. So that was the biggest detail that she remembered was that it had blue eyes. I'm just not sure about that either, just because I don't know if people have ever seen any dogmen with any other colors besides brown or black or even yellow. So again, I mean, that's really unique. I mean, it was unique for me. And then I always try to put things in a logical box as much as possible, unless it just doesn't fit that box. But... You know, and I know that some dogs will stand on their hind legs to get a better look at something if it interests them. But I also know that they can't stand on their hind legs for very long. So it's really hard to know. Yeah, that one is hard to know what exactly happened. Dogmen can come in almost any color that a dog or a wolf can come in, except for the reds and blues that, say, a red Doberman might be, or a Weimaran or grayish-blue color, but... Yeah, if you're talking about a husky or a wolf or anything like that, yeah, they can be any of those colors. And the fact that it had blue eyes, she said, yeah, that doesn't preclude the chance that it was a dogman because there have been some credible eyewitnesses who reported seeing dogmen with blue eyes too. So, it could have been. In case the listeners haven't noticed, cryptid sightings seem to run in your family. Do you have any theories on why that is? Honestly, it kind of started with my grandfather. Actually, my great-grandfather, he supposedly had some sightings in China. He was a missionary of a blue tiger, which I think has been known kind of as a cryptid, but that was like over 100 years ago when he was there. And my grandfather, his son, is the one that actually first told me about Bigfoot. And I had a sighting, if you remember from when I did Bigfoot Eyewitness Radio with you, I mentioned the very big Sasquatch that I saw on his farm. And he was well aware of that individual being there. So he was having his own sightings. I mean, I have theories about it. You know, I kind of wonder if it has to do with blood type for some reason or just different possibilities. 
but it does seem like some people have more encounters than others. I mean, I don't, I personally don't think that's something to brag about. I mean, I really hated it for a long time and didn't want to talk about it and didn't want to talk about all the things that I remembered. But even first talking about that and even just trying to make the connections between my family history and my own history and now my children are experiencing things, I really was uncomfortable even having to deal with it. But now that I am and being able to have an open line of communication with my kids and say, yes, this is something that we experience. I don't really know why, but if you come to me and tell me that you're having these experiences, I'm going to believe you instead of telling them that it's not happening. I mean, there's no point in doing that. So I really wish I had an answer for that, you know, and I'd actually love to hear anybody else's theory on why some families or some people see these more than others because it'd be nice to know if there's some sort of correlation so that to be better prepared, I guess. That's really the only way that I can describe it. But I wish I had a solid answer on why my family is the way it is. I just don't know. I really don't. Like you said, it's just one of those things that we're probably never going to know the answer to. It's hard to figure out. You've been researching possible connections between dogmen and cemeteries for a while now. Have you made any interesting discoveries on that? Well, I've tried to look at the history, especially when it comes to like Anubis, you know, or even just other mythology of talking about these type of creatures guarding these areas. So I kind of accidentally got started on that because in a small town, I think it's east of here, called Legardo, there's an old church that has a cemetery next to it that some of it's is historical. And in fact, immediately across the street is a Civil War cemetery that's very small. And in the area, it's got a healthy amount of trees. But in the dead center of this graveyard that is next to this old church is a very large, I think it's some kind of pine tree, and it had three breaks in it. And it's very obvious that they're breaks and that they're twists. And it's in a plot surrounded by a couple of families, but one of the headstones had a Freemason symbol on it. And so I began to wonder if there was some kind of connection between, you know, just like we just talked about, you know, my family has had a lot of sightings and it's part of my family history going back, you know, at least several generations and it's even happening to my own kids. So I started to wonder if maybe there really is some sort of family tie. Maybe it's not necessarily about them guarding the dead, or maybe there's some sort of fascination with the dead, or if there's some sort of negative evil entity, there's a lot of intense human emotion around graveyards with people just grieving, and maybe they're somehow drawn to that energy. I don't know. But I found that fascinating, and that was actually the first cemetery that I visited where I noticed tree breaks. The next one that I went to is actually really not very far from me. It's a very, very large cemetery. And there are tree breaks in different areas. There's one, and I sent you the picture of this one tree that's got a couple of different breaks. That tree overlooks a children's cemetery. In fact, I think the oldest person buried might be 18. And most of the children buried there were young. Some of them were infants. Some of them were toddlers. And oddly enough, I had my girls with me during that time, and we walked around, and they were looking at the birthdays and the dates of death. Most of those children died in October, which was really strange. I don't know if there's some sort of weird correlation, but I thought that was a very interesting coincidence and so didn't they and these are different family names so I don't think they were all related and most of it was back in the turn of the 19th century and I also forgot to mention 
that when we found that, my middle daughter thought she saw something in the wood line about 300 yards away from us in her peripheral vision. And when she tried to point it out to us, the rest of us couldn't see it. But she felt like something was there watching us. And I had forgot to mention that to you in the pre-interview, but bringing this up made me remember that. And she didn't get a good look at it, but she definitely said she felt like whatever it was, it was definitely watching us and had a very distinct, you know, interest in what we were doing. And that same day is when we found that footprint, which looks very much like a Sasquatch print. And in fact, that is my middle daughter's foot next to it in the picture that I sent you. That was the same day. I have not been able to to get out just because I've been busy to go research any other cemeteries. But my initial plan as far as research this year is I'd like to visit some of the other cemeteries to see if I find any more interesting tree breaks or anything around certain plots because that's where it seems to be. I'm also thinking about maybe visiting some of the archaeological parks that we have here that have burial grounds to see if there's anything around those. So I don't have any definitive proof of anything, just what I'm finding left behind. And I don't really have any strong theories. It's just more of this is an interesting correlation. You know, you have these variations happening in certain areas and not others, especially around the Children's Cemetery. I thought that was really, really fascinating that there was all these breaks and the one footprint and stuff there. So who knows? I think the strongest thing I have to go on is maybe just the amount of emotion in a place like a cemetery draws them in. You know, maybe there's just something about that that may draw them in or fascinate them. I have no idea for sure. That just might be what's behind it. I'm sure there's a simple answer for why they do seem to hang around cemeteries the way they do, but it's just too bad that we don't have any concrete answers on that. Exactly. When you came on episode 72 and told us about dogman encounters you had, you left out some details. What details did you forget to mention? Well, the encounters that I had behind my house when I was either four or five with the juvenile type three, if that's what it was, I did have one other encounter with her that I wasn't ready to talk about at the time. Coming out and talking about this stuff for the first time was very hard for me. It was very traumatizing in a lot of ways because I think I was finally accepting that it was real. And there was just some things that I didn't want to deal with. You know, not even having the physical contact was nearly as hard as I think I really kind of had an attachment to her. And I say that because I remember after my father had told me that I was no longer to go into the woods because, you know, and I'm not sure if I should back up a little bit and recap, but let me just go ahead and do that. The encounters I was having with her started with her blocking the path to this little playhouse that I used to go into. And things really heated up when I had a friend of mine, like a playmate, come to the house, and our parents were friends, but this little girl was really kind of shy, and I was trying to make her feel at ease, and so I said, well, let me show you my secret place, which was this playhouse. And so I brought her back to the playhouse, and this creature, which was always with another one, and I never, ever saw the face or the head of this other one, but this other one was orange and very big, and she would follow it around and she was much smaller and sort of a dirty blonde color. And this little girl and I were in the playhouse and she came through and she saw us. And then she kind of cornered us by lodging her body in the door. And we both ended up crying and getting hysterical. And I ended up pounding on this creature's feet and yelling at her to move, which she did eventually. And then we ran out, and when we got to my backyard, her father was there, and he'd been looking for her. She was absolutely hysterical. He took her home, and I went back out into the forest and started talking to her, because I, I believe it was a female, and I told her, I'm really sorry that I hit you, but my friend 
peed on herself and you scared her. And then she reappeared and she and I sat down. We were actually sitting Indian style. I mean, that's, that's kind of just the crazy details I remember. And I remember her looking me over and she pat me on the head and then she pulled me to her side and laid down with me and having very intense feelings of fear just course through me the thought process of I'm never going home I will never see my mother again this thing is going to kill me it's going to eat me it's going to carry me off and somehow even at a young age just maintaining the ability to try to stay as calm as possible and I think I actually learned that from either my dad or my mother telling me that when you're around a strange dog oddly enough to not show fear So those thoughts were going through my head of, even though I was afraid, don't show this creature any fear because I don't know what it's going to do or how it would respond. But I do remember that I ended up putting my hand on her chest and no smell that I noticed except for leaves. There was dry leaf litter on the ground. But I also do remember seeing what looked like a pair of underdeveloped breasts on his chest. And so that's why I refer to it as her. And then my sister called my name, or actually before I heard her, the creature heard her. And the creature dropped me, lightning fast, was on all fours. Her eyes went completely black and looked very nocturnal is really the only way I can describe them. Just very large and black and a very, very deep growl emanating from her chest. And then I heard my sister calling my name. And I said, hey, that's my sister. And she kind of looked at me sideways and stopped growling at least. But then she started to look around, I think, for a place to hide, I'm imagining. And then I got up and I ran to my sister and I said, hey, let me show you my friend. And she told me, never mind that. We ended up going into the house. My father told me that his friend had called and his daughter had told him everything that happened. And he asked for an explanation and I was terrified that I was in trouble, so I didn't give him one. But he had explained, you know, you need to stay out of those woods. I absolutely forbid you to ever go back there. And that was pretty much it. Just a recap of that incident. The two things that I remember... One was just a memory that came back later, and that was at night, I would be asleep in that house, and I would wake up, and there would be eyes at the window, and this was a second-story window, staring at me. And Sometimes it would be several pairs. They were always red. Sometimes there would be strange noises that would sound like mumbled talking or growls. But it would wake me up out of a dead sleep, and I would try to shut my eyes and go back to sleep, and then I'd open my eyes again, and they would still be staring. So I started to take to sleeping in between the wall and the bed. I scared my parents a few times when they would come in to wake me up because I wouldn't be in bed and they couldn't find me. And finally, one morning, my dad asked me, he said, why are you doing this? You know, why aren't you sleeping in your bed? And I said... This way, the eyes won't see me. And I remember, I actually remember the look on his face of just kind of going pale, like, what does that mean? You know, the eyes, what eyes? And so I explained to him the best I could that there were eyes at the window at night watching me. And I think he may have thought that I was imagining things or hoped that I was imagining things. The second memory I have or what I was remembering when I was talking to you about this the first time, but I really wasn't ready to talk about, had more to deal with the emotions behind it. After my dad told me I could no longer go into those woods, I stopped playing in the backyard intentionally and just took to playing on our front stoop. And there was one day I was out there playing and the dog man came back And she was standing at an angle where I could only see, like, one of her eyes peeking around the house. And I remember looking at her. I stood up, and I think I looked away, but I remember saying, I'm very sorry, but I can't play with you anymore. 
and took my stuff and went inside the house. But I remember how sad I felt. And it was something that I really didn't want to talk about yet or even relive. But I actually shared this with some other people. And when I did, I just remember crying because for me, being as young as I was, even though some of the situations were terrifying and they were, I think I was growing a bit of an attachment to her. You know, I I referred to her as my friend because I think I was innocent enough for that as a child. I didn't really know what I was dealing with. And so at that point, I knew that it was kind of a letting go of this. You know, like my father had talked enough sense into me to realize that this was a bad situation. It was a very dangerous situation and it was not something to play with. So those are the things that I had left out in 72 originally. Did you ever get a good look at that type 3 dog man's teeth? Yes, and they really were kind of jagged in some ways. I do remember some canines, and that's about it. But that was only when she was in the playhouse and she had us blocked in, and she was making a lot of vocalizations. And had her teeth, you know, was showing her teeth. And I, and I really don't know if it was aggression or amusement, but I kind of seem to think that she was amused with the idea of having us trapped in there. I realize this was some time ago that you had those experiences with that creature, but you just described her teeth as looking jagged in appearance. Did you get a good enough look, and do you remember if the teeth around her canines were sharp, or by saying jagged, I think you mean pointed, Or were they somewhat human-like in appearance and flat? They weren't human-like and flat. I think sharp. Or maybe even broken. I don't really know. They just didn't... They didn't look like ours, but they also didn't look like a dog's. Or they had the appearance of being jagged. and, And I don't really know why. I mean, I think her teeth were gritted together. So it could have just given it the illusion of appearing that way. It's really, really hard for me to know, for sure. Well, that's interesting. Also, talked about her feet. The tops of her feet, they were almost rounded, if that makes sense. Okay, so there was a curve to the tops of her feet. They weren't flat like the tops of ours or apes. Hers appeared rounded, and those I got a pretty good look at because I was slamming my fist into the top of them. And also one thing that I remembered was the whole side of my right hand, pinky down, was bruised purple from that incident. I don't think I broke anything, but I do remember having those deep bruises from pounding onto the top of her feet, which were extremely hard. And I did also remember the palms of her hands were more mitt-like, not ape-like, not human-like, just sort of, they just reminded me of mitts, but I think those were actual pads on her hands that were more dog-like than human or ape-like. And I don't remember any claws on her fingers for sure. I didn't remember getting a very good look at them as I did everything else on her. And so it's interesting that you mentioned the teeth because I think from my perspective as a five-year-old, even just the sharp edges in the teeth would appear to make almost a jagged pattern if her mouth was clenched and she was showing a grimace, you know? So that's, that's really interesting that you brought that up. You started your own Facebook page for Dogman and Sasquatch Research. Please tell us about it and why you created it. Well, I've had so much stuff going on, and I've been putting a lot of things out there. I've sent videos to other researchers of things that I've discovered or just data in general, and I just kind of figured that it'd be best to just sort of have a place to share that, but also a place for other eyewitnesses as well. So I started a Facebook page that's an acronym for Lisa, and it's Lichen International Sasquatch Association. So we're dealing with Dogman and Sasquatch, but also anything else out there, any kind of cryptids that anybody may have encountered, or even something that's unexplainable maybe anything that's in the paranormal or supernatural realm that can't be explained. But I just wanted to be able to create a place where people can at least just talk about it and just bounce theories back and forth or even just share their experiences and get any kind of feedback. I personally do not believe that there are experts 
my whole theory about that is Dogman's the expert and Sasquatch is the expert. We're not experts. You know, we can collect as much data as possible and compare notes and see variations and similarities. And some of it's going to be absolute, like they come in these colors or they behave a certain way, but that's really all that we have. So I don't claim to be an expert in any way, even with all the experiences that I've had. It still just kind of leads to more questions. You know, all I can do is just repeat and share what my five senses have told me and leave it at that. So we're easy to find if anybody's interested in checking us out. You know, I plan to get a little bit more in depth when I can, but I just figure as much as I've been involved with this or it has been involved with me, I might as well do something with it. I'm glad you are. So that you know, I'm going to put a link to your page in the description of tonight's show so that you can easily find it. Well, it's about time for us to get out of here, Elisa. Before we do, do you have any closing comments you'd like to share? I think the only thing I can say is just to just keep an open mind and to know that you're not alone if you're experiencing these things. You're not crazy. It's real. There are resources out there for you if you want to talk about it and try to get some more insight. And that's about it. You hit the nail on the head. If you've seen a dog, man, you're definitely not alone. I'm glad you mentioned that. Well, thank you so much for your time and coming on and sharing these experiences with us. I really do appreciate it. Yeah, no problem. I really do. Well, have yourself a great night, okay? All right. I'll talk to you later. Thanks. Bye. Bye. If you've had a dogman encounter of your own and would like to speak with me, whether in private or on the show, please go to dogmanencounters.com and submit a report. I'd love to hear from you.